Hello, everyone. I want you to think back to the last time that you stood in the line for coffee, for lunch, and what you did. So hands up how many people chatted to someone else that they didn't know. Oh, good. <laughs> hands up people who let their mind wander, who daydreamed. Okay, quite a lot. And hands up people who looked at their phone. Okay, even for some of the time? <laughs> okay, so a few more. So I want to take you through what happens in your brain with each one of those choices. And they are a choice, and they all have different effects on your brain. So if you talked to somebody, what happens when we first start to lock eyes with a person is we get a number of things happening. We get spindle neurons, mirror neurons, we get all sorts of neural activity. The social network kicks in, we get oxytocin, dopamine, we can get um, really nice positive chemicals if it's funny. So we start creating a connection and the spindle neurons especially start to think, well, you might see that person again. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to begin to make a piece of that person in your brain so that you can identify them in case we have an ongoing relationship because we are social beings with long-term social relationships. If you daydreamed, that's quite interesting because what we do all the time is we force our brains into task. And when you daydream, you go into something called abstraction. And what that does is allow the brain to wander and to make connections that it makes very well. It, it's a good thing that doing that. We just stop doing it because we distract it with games and with, with lots and lots of things that we have to do. When you're in abstraction, because you can connect and you're not forcing your brain to connect any specific way, you get insight. So that's often when you're looking out the window when you're on a difficult problem and you suddenly go, ah, that's what we do. It's because you've allowed new connections that you're not trying to force. But the other thing you get is you get insight into yourself. So we become more self-aware. And we often don't do that. We distract ourselves all the time. If you go to the phone, then that's what that is. It's task or distraction. So you're actually shaping your brain each time. No, it's fine. It sounds weird in my head. So what you do is you have to think about actively what is the decision that I want to make when I interact. And the phone is a, it's a very positive thing. I love technology. I work with it. But it's very sticky and it's designed to make us interact with it all the time. And we are better interacting face to face in a lot of situations because we're hardwired to do that. So there's something human called interpersonal neural synchronization. And it means that your brain actually synchronizes with another person. And if I was scanning both of you, so if we were talking about something and I was scanning both of us and you were really good at telling a story and putting that picture into my mind, then your social networks would be highly um, activating and so would mine. And so you know that when you're in that zone with someone, you know it's really good sharing a story, that's what's happening. We are synchronising physically and we have a number, a cascade of those chemicals occurring. So what does that mean for your relationships with different people? If we take your family, one of the things that you need to think about is when you use the mobile phone. So if you have a small child, then they can normally get you off it because they yell at you. If you have a partner and you're at dinner, hopefully you get on well enough so that if one of you does get distracted by the phone, the other one can say, excuse me, and you put it down. But what happens to that, that group of children in the middle you know, that are sort of five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, those sort of people, and especially girls, what we're finding is that there's a lot of information around regarding their self-worth and their feeling of importance is dropping. Because if you think about it, every time you say, just a minute, just a minute, just a minute, what you're actually saying is you're not as important as this. And we all know what it feels like. If someone's talking to us and they're actually not concentrating, if they're distracted, I don't know about you, but what I tend to do is either not talk or I think about something or talk about something that doesn't really matter. And that's what happens. We disconnect from each other because we're not really listening to the other person. So what happens with teenagers? They don't want to talk to you anyway because they're on their phone. We'd c we joke about teenagers being together and all being on their phones together. And, and I've had two. And I work with a lot of them part-time. And they say, but you, you don't get it. This is our way of connecting. It's just connecting in a different way. 
But what they're not getting is all of those wonderful chemicals. They're not getting that synchrony. They're not getting a number of those chemicals that bind us into that trust relationship that is a social network. So what you start to look at is an increase in feeling isolated. And it happens even more with teenagers because what happens in teenagers is their brains are pruning wildly because they're getting ready for independence. So they have lots and lots of connections to parents being pruned away and they're building lots of new connections to peers. So it's even more desperate that they connect directly with peers, which is why they're stuck to that phone all the time. And they think that the dopamine spike that you get when the message goes off, because it feels good, we all do that, we're all partly addicted to that, that feeling, is the same thing, but it's not. It's not the same thing as that empathic connection that you get, that you're part of a whole. So we then start to see increases in depression and feelings of isolation. A number of things start to cascade out of that. If you think about older people, you might have grandparents or you might look at people who are um, in aged care or, or ill. I've just finished a study on the neurophysiological effect of touch and eye gaze on healing. And it was fascinating. The things we can do for each other neurophysiologically are amazing. So I'll give you one. I'll pick you. If I'm your nurse and you come into a hospital, you're fine. We start to talk and I obviously take your hand to maybe take your pulse, which means I also touch your C-fibres. So that's another thing. C-fibres go through the emotional parts of your brain before they're registered. So they start their own chemical you know, reaction. So you've got all of these things happening to do with spindle mirror neurons, all sorts of C-fibre connections. And we start to build that tiny little nub of trust with each other. So you go off, you have your operation and you see me on shift and we get on and we have the little robot nurse, you know, giving you your lunch and that kind of thing. But then you get stressed. You might be in pain, you might be anxious. And what happens when I come into the room is amazing. It's called retinal eye lock. So when we look at each other, when our eyes actually lock, one of your retinas aligns with one of my retinas. The right hemisphere of your brain synchronises with the right hemisphere of my brain and the amygdala phasing in your brain changes. I can physically calm you down by looking directly at you because you trust me and you like me. I think of how amazing that is. And you've probably done it with a child, maybe, that you've hugged them and looked into their eyes and been able to calm them down, or a partner. And you actually get other things. You get a drop in cortisol, you get a rise in dopamine, you, as more than you can get in the tablet. You get all sorts of things happening. So we have an incredible effect on each other when we interact directly. Even at work, that same sort of thing, kicking off immune systems, changing the way that we're working, also lets us be more creative. So when we come together in a work sense and look directly at each other, not only are we better at collaboration, but we're also more creative. And if we're really excited about something, then you know how sometimes you get really in that zone and you, you know where you're going with each other and you can build a really good idea? It's because your immune system's actually giving out chemicals that your brain uses to make brand new brain. So that can be what's happening in that process. So the effect that we have is just incredible. And a really important part of it is empathy. What happens when we look at each other is we start off that empathic pathway. And not only does it make us feel part of a whole, it makes us feel connected and valued and loved. But it's quite technical. So empathy is not just that, that nice, you know, squishy feeling. Empathy is a technical path that your brain takes in a complex problem. And there are many. So if we have a complex issue, what the brain says is, I'm missing some information. So what I'm going to do is go back into all of the vaults of knowledge of your brain and I'm going to use different criteria. And I'm going to base it on a state it called discernment. When you're in discernment mode, you look for information which is based on consequences and has a long lens. So you think about it, that's completely different than the what do I want right here, right now, short-termism that we're seeing everywhere. We're seeing it in organisations, we're seeing it in government decisions, we see it push things like reality television and social networks and media, we see it all over the place. Because when you constantly are doing nothing but looking at a technological method of interacting, it changes the way your amygdala actually works. It lowers your capacity to empathically engage. So we've got a number of decisions to make, but I'll leave you today with, with one basic one. 
I want you to think actively about how you want to shape your brain and heart and that of the people that you interact with. So the piece of technology that we hold in our hand is, is a wonderful thing. It's very, very um, capable of making us you know, smarter, connect, well not smarter, but actually get more information and connect in all sorts of ways. But it's built to be maximally sticky. It's built to have you look at it from the time you get up to the time you go to bed with all sorts of the things that it does to you. But we are built to look into each other's eyes for all the reasons we've just been talking about. We have neurophysiological effects on each other. We build empathic capacity. We build complex problem-solving capacity. We even build new brain. And we certainly make each other feel better and more connected and happier. So I want you to think about that in the things that you do. The next time you go to work, get up and talk to someone. When you go home and you want to connect with your loved one, connect with them. Leave the phone away. Turn it off. It's also better for you. We get so addicted to that constant um, on-call 24 hours that we're in something called hypervigilance. It's actually not good for us at all. So really go home and connect. And my challenge, my little challenge, is the next time you're in the line and from now on, when you get your coffee or your lunch, don't pick your phone up. Now you might not be ready to talk to someone straight away. Daydream, so you get that lovely insight. But what that does is it gives someone else that might be more comfortable talking to you a chance to talk to you because you're not distracted by the phone. And if everybody did that, just those small things, if everybody was aware of how important it is to have direct eye contact, to have direct spatial contact with each other, then we might set off a contagion because that's what happens with those positive chemicals. You know how someone smiles, you smile back. And imagine how much happier and healthier and more engaged and more valued we'd all feel in the world if we just took that little connection constantly. Thank you.